recognize uh, Dr. Christina Melvin for item number eight. Chairman Cates, thank you so much. The first report tonight, the superintendent's report, is from our Chief of Finance and Operations, Mr. Richardson. Thank you, Dr. Melvin, members of the board. Um, the purpose for me being here tonight is obviously to uh, talk about our general fund budget and what's changed since we last, uh, well, since we approved our budget in August. Just a quick reminder of what we were looking at prior to, to COVID-19. We were looking at some uh, some of our costs going up across the board for our employee, uh, for our employee um, fringe benefits. We we're also looking at raises for teachers. Uh, all of our employees getting step increases as normal and any type of additional staff that we may need to keep our class sizes and, and board policies in check. Then COVID came and some things have changed. Um, we went ahead and approved a budget what I thought was going to be worst case scenario. However, uh, it turned out to be a little worse than what we originally anticipated, so that's why we're here with the amendment. So I wanted to give you a brief update on what happened back in September. Uh, for two weeks, the legislature uh, reconvened to discuss the South Carolina Appropriations Act, and um, the Senate went through the budget and actually did pretty good for us. Uh, they actually put $50 million towards the base due to cost to help fund teacher step increases, and um, also had some money in there for local government fund, which would have helped uh, the local uh, municipalities and counties and also had $5 million in a special reserve account to help offset any type of budget cuts that may be coming along. Um, like I said, the House passed that, uh, went to the Senate, the Senate ran it across the desk, Senate to Ways and Means Committee where it died. So what we have is a continuing resolution. We continue to operate on the continuing resolution that was approved back in um, the spring. So we are, um, I guess in a position where we really don't know what's going on as far as state revenues go. Um, the, the, the House has said that in January when they convene, uh, the legislature convenes, they'll take a look at where we are revenue-wise in the state. And if things are looking better what, than what they're anticipating, then they will do a supplemental um, appropriations and um, I guess try to fund teacher raises and those kind of things. <coughs> So these are the considerations we had prior to all of this happening. And the things we have highlighted here are the things that we've taken out of this budget because of the fact that we're um, not really going to be giving any type of increase, salary increases for any of our employees at this time. So our step increases, which we thought would be retroactive back to the beginning of the year, um, has been set aside. The uh, Senate, however, had put that in their budget, and they did make them retroactive. But like I said, since the budget didn't pass, we're right back to where we started from with the um, continued resolution. The employer health insurance uh, premium increases have been suspended as well. So that was some, so that was some uh, funding that we had budgeted, uh, or some expenditures that we had budgeted, we were able to remove from the budget because that is no longer going to happen. And then of course, step increases for all the rest of our employees in the district, we are um, not going to do as well. This is just a continuing resolution that was adopted and um, came into effect on July 1st. And part two of this is what I want to draw your attention to, talking about the state minimum salary schedule will remain at the fiscal year 2019-2020 level. Um, and step increases are suspended until an annual appropriations act is enacted. So, to update you from where we are, we in this budget now we have no step increases for our employees. We have uh, the employer health insurance increases have been removed from this budget. Oh, sorry. Technology um, deficient. The um, property tax relief that we had uh, originally thought that we were going to get has been revised because we received a letter from Revenue and Fiscal Affairs saying that the growth factor that they had originally thought was going to be in place to provide the funding that we have for our property tax relief has been lowered. Um, 
So therefore, and you'll see this a little bit later, uh, that money has been, or that revenue stream has been reduced as well. We also had reassessment in Lexington County. It doesn't affect our funding necessarily, but what it did do uh, is allow us to roll back millage. So <clears throat> when Lexington County went through reassessment, we, we have a law on the books that says that we have to have equivalent millage in Richland and Lexington counties. So we combined those two assessments. Um, the county auditors agreed to this, this, and we are rolling back our millage 10.8 mills for operations from, for School District 5. So our new millage rate is going from 256.9 mills to 246.1 mills. This is to show you um, this work, the items I uh, spoke about um, just a minute ago, just to sh see the numbers. When we take the step increases out for our employees, it reduced our salary line items by $1,698,022. Uh, the associated friends benefits and the, and the health insurance that went along with that were reduced by $927,319. We did add back in $266,540 to our contract of services, and what that's for is our substitutes for Kelly Services, our substitutes there because of what's going on with COVID. We thought that budget um, might need to be increased a little bit to get us through this year. We, we don't know, but, um, but we did that. And then, of course, our budget has now been reduced, or our projected expenditures have now been reduced by a total of $2,358,000. $801. Um, this is that much less than what we approved in August. Nothing changes on our local taxes, um, hopefully, at least right now. We don't anticipate that. And then state revenue. Um, I'll draw your attention to the Education Finance Act line, which is the fourth line down. That, we're reducing that amount due to the fact that we have lost approximately 580 students since the 135th day last year. Now, hopefully, when we return back to face-to-face, -face, some of those students will come back in, but we're going to go ahead and plan that those students will never come back uh, it, this year, um, so that funding will be reduced by, hopefully, no more than $1.1 million. And then, like I said, I spoke earlier about the property tax relief tier 3. That's been reduced by 200 and $26,583. So you can see our total revenue, state revenue, is decreasing by $1.3 million. Those are really the only changes that we had, other than the fact that we don't anticipate, assuming things stay on course the way we are right now, that we'll have to dip into our operational balance in order to balance our budget. I also want to uh, mention while we're here, too, that. We haven't st started seeing any, uh, I guess, budget cuts, and hopefully we won't this year, but um, I did want to, I've been asked this question a couple more minutes, so I wanted to mention this, that one of the reasons why we use ESSER funds to pay for our student nutrition staff and our custodial staff earlier was that so we could reduce our expenditures and carry forward as much as we could coming into the new fiscal year from last year in anticipation of some budget cuts. I know back in 2009, um, we actually had a rescission bill and five budget cuts during, this, during that fiscal year. That's what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about the future um, and trying to deal with that. So this is why we've done this. This is why we cut off spending when we did to try to carry forward as much as we could into this fiscal year to help us ride this, this um, hopefully downturn in the economy and we, you know, we'll get us through this fiscal year without having a uh, great impact in the classroom. As you can see, we have a, we're anticipating a balanced budget right now with our projected revenue and expenditures being $196,524,672. This would have been our allowable millage increase had we decided to go that route. Um, and as you can see, the, the new millage increase uh, is based on, excuse me, the cap is based on the new millage rate um, in the district, not the old millage rate. So we could have gone approximately six mils uh, if we had needed to. And this also is the, I believe the fourth consecutive year we have not had a millage increase for operations in this school district. Dr. Melton, that 
concludes my presentation on our budget. Um, I'd be glad to try to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Chairman Gates? For the questions, Mr. Lovins. Uh, Mr. Richardson, did we budget for the employer health insurance increase of 6.73% and the original budget that you showed us that we approved? Did we budget that? Yes, sir, we did. Um, um, the annual increase was six points, and we only budget for six months um, because that would actually take effect in January. So that was part of the reduction in the fringe benefits line you saw. Okay, that's already been accounted for in there? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Other questions? Ms. Hamlin. Mr. Richardson. Mr. Richardson, um, if I know we're on the continuing resolution, if the legislature goes back and does pass a budget, would the teachers and the other employees step increase be retroactive? That would be entirely up to the legislature, but they could pass a supplemental appropriations and require us to make that retroactive. Okay, but that would be up to them? Yes, yes ma'am. Have they given the date that, uh, that for sure they're gonna go back to, to look at the budget? Um, it's, it's already set on the calendar. I don't recall something But they have January. January. Yes. Okay, um, and then one, one other one, one with that, if I might, Mr. Cates. Um, the employee health increase, that would that would not be retroactive, would it? Or we don't know? No, well, we don't know, but I would, I would think not. I would think that they just suspended that for the entire fiscal year. Okay, thank you. Mr. Richardson, I'm, can you talk a little bit about the property tax tier three? I was thinking that was a, a locked in amount. What, what caused that to fluctuate? Was that well, it typically is a lot in amount. Um, I'll tell you what the um, letter we got said, and um, it, it was based upon what they use as a growth factor. Or, and the letter stated that um, due to the impact of COVID-19 on the economy, the revised forecast estimates lower growth, obviously, in the state. And that's why the tier three money is reduced from Originally, it projected a 4% growth factor. Um, they reduced that to 2.72% uh, growth factor, and that, was, that resulted in a $226,000 decrease in our funding. Thank you. Mr. Lovelace. Mr. Richardson, how much would, uh, you may not even, we may not even know this answer to this question, but how much would the step increases have been to our district had we received those from the state government? Um, I don't know. I did not see the, um, any estimates on what that would have brought to us. But it cost this district for our certified staff, our teachers, and everyone approximately $1.6 million. So the step increases would be $1.6 roughly yes, sir. This, this year? Yes, sir. And, and if we, you know, I, I mean, this is a dicey game, but I mean, Looks like to me that there that there will be supplemental uh, information coming from the state since this is a continuing resolution we're operating on. So, if if the district were to to offer something like that, what would be the ramifications of that? Well, all I can tell you is that the that the um, continuing resolution suspended it. Um, I'm not sure what the ramifications would be if we decide to go ahead with it. I'm not aware of any school district in the state that decided to go ahead with it. I'm not saying none did, but I'm not aware of any. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Yes, Ms. Hutchison. Uh, Mr. Richardson, did I hear you correctly say that this has been, this is the fourth consecutive year where we have not increased the millage for operation just now. I think we need to. I need to sell. We need to celebrate that. I think that's good. And to celebrate you and your staff. I know you. You keep a sharp pencil, um, so to speak, over there. But congratulations to to the all the administrators for really being very careful with taxpayer money. And thank you for the hard work that you do, um, Mr. Richardson, and your like I said, and your whole staff for helping us. Good. We get, get all the wonderful education, and uh, yet you've been able to save taxpayer money. I'd like to take credit for everything, but that's that's um, obviously something that our entire organization did, you know, hand in hand. Um, 
you know, we've, we've talked, um, everybody has gotten to where they're serving and they understand what we're trying to do, and, and I think it's starting to see the benefits of that. Will the, um, I'm looking at slide six, and it's talking about the reassessment in Lexington County and the equivalent millage rollback of 10.8 mills. Is that something that will be reflected in tax bills? I know that we don't really, can you explain that a little bit? Sure, um, really what that means is when they go to a reassessment, um, what you're trying to do is um, actually a limited how much assessments can go up annually. <clears throat> so um, every five years required to go through reassessment. And uh, at that point in time, it take, you assume that your assessments are going in the county. Um, so what you what you try to do is come up to a millage rate that would bring you the same dollars as you did the higher millage rate launch of last year. So that's what that rollback is. Each mill is going to be worth more than it was last fiscal year, or last calendar year, actually. Um, so we're expecting 246 mills to bring us the same amount of money that 256 did last year. Thank you. Other questions? Dr. Mott, does that conclude that part of the report? Yes, sir. And if I may echo Ms. Hutchison's uh, comments, I'd like to thank Mr. Richardson and also Director of Finance, Mr. Sheely, their expertise and experience in public education to include the State Department of Education and working with state government as well positioned School District 5. As Mr. Richardson said, every staff member that contributes to spending in School District 5 and the conservation of funds and the responsibility have contributed to this story tonight. But Mr. Richardson, I commend you and Mr. Sheely and your staff for making sure that we are in this position. Um, great appreciation goes out to our directors and our principals when we implemented our freezing, in a sense, of spending back in the spring. Very quickly, our staff understood what we were doing and why we were doing it. And we started this new fiscal year at what we thought we were expecting. We did not release 100% of their budgets. We released 90% and held back 10%. So oftentimes you all don't get to see behind the veil of operations in School District 5 to know what our staff is doing. But I'd like for this board to know that's, that's the kind of effort our staff is putting forward. And that's the kind of leadership School District 5 provides. So Mr. Richardson, Mr. Sheely, thank you so much for both of you. Mr. Gates, I will refer to you. This item uh, comes before the board. I'll entertain a motion to adopt the 2020-2021 uh, general fund budget as amended before you. Do I have a motion? Ms. Hammond. The motion for Ms. Hammond is that we approve the 2020-21 general fund budget amendment. Is there a second? Ms. Hutchison, any discussion? As many as favor the motion will raise their hand. That appears to be unanimous, thank you. Dr. Melton, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Cates. Uh, next up on my report for this evening is re-entry part seven. Ms. Price, thank you so much for pulling that up. Uh, obviously, as we get ready for this evening, we are now in Week two of operating with four days of our pre-K through second grade. Um, as I advance through these slides, this slide is one that you all have seen before. Ms. Price, if you could advance for me. Thank you. These principles you all have seen before of the work that the reentry team and I are working um, with with our decision making. I pause this evening to make sure that I share another story with all of you that our staff continues to remain focused on the vision and mission of School District 5. Our teachers are teaching in a brand new dynamic environment. They're focusing on our students' needs and also the expectations that we have that are so high for curriculum and instruction. Our support staff continues to contribute in their areas of expertise to how School District 5 is operating because their contributions are so important to our success. Our students continue to build relationships with our teachers, their new instructional team, their new administrative teams, and we make sure that we're working through this new learning environment opportunity of the 2021 academic year that has never been recorded before. 
And of course, our families continue to be partners. Um, there's so many stories that our teachers and our principals and our district office administrators could share of how our families have reached out to us to share when things aren't going well and things that are going well. From celebrations of things that our teachers so naturally do with the commitment to our students and also ideas that our families have. And sometimes, sometimes the stress and frustration of how we are currently operating. So I continue to say that our most important resource is our willingness and commitment to listen. And I hope that our second most valuable resource, beyond our people and our time, of course, is the expectation to be empathetic and to make sure that we're responsive to the needs because, as Ms. Gardner shared during our prayer this evening, we know that the mental well-being, physical and social emotional well-being, which is my priority five, have definitely been exposed much differently during this time of operation. The next slide we have for you this evening is one that you've seen before of our phases of reentry. This graphic, of course, has been updated to show that we are currently in phase two that started last Monday, the 5th of October. We're preparing for phase three of third through sixth grade next Monday. And the next slide, we have some updates. Based upon some questions that we heard last board meeting and also questions that we've received from our families for our students, we wanted to make sure that we brought forth an update and to make sure that we have a point of clarity that we've been working with principals and other leaders across School District 5 on. Our Chief of Planning Administration, Dr. Harris, will come forth first to get us started with the conversation regarding grading and attendance. Dr. Harris. Thank you so much, and good I am uh, certainly happy to uh, engage in a, a review and an update regarding uh, questions uh, related to our last board meeting as it relates to grading and attendance. And uh, we have uh, invited uh, our student services officer, uh, Ms. Kelly Brown, to come and talk with us about grading and attendance that, is, that falls within the wheelhouse here in the student services arena. Thank you, Dr. We'll start with the hybrid model. The guidelines provided by the State Department of Education advises the interconnectedness of grades and attendance for the duration of the hybrid model. So if you look at, for attendance in the hybrid model, we look at work completion, as well as students participating and being present during live instruction. I want to note one correction before we uh, proceed. It says if the student is absent, the teacher will give a zero in the grade book to serve as a placeholder. Our principals have met and discussed the zero, and in lieu of the zero, we are encouraging teachers to add the comment missing, as opposed to giving a student a zero. So that's uh, the correction will read, if a student is absent, the teacher will add the comment zero in the grade book to serve as a placeholder, and note the missing work. And the student is expected to complete the assignments within the designated time frame in order to replace the comment missing with a grade that reflects the submitted work. It is important uh, also for both teachers and parents to communicate, to monitor, and allow for intervention to assure, ensure students are meeting virtual and or on-site attendance expectations. As always, parents are encouraged to communicate with teachers and our attendance clerks regarding any and all absences. For our five and or on-site face-to-face attendance and grades, grades and attendance are isolated, so we encourage our uh, families to refer to the grading and attendance guidelines. So keep in mind that five and on-site are very familiar uh, platforms. And when a student chooses five, they are basically uprooting the classroom for their brick and mortar and transferring it to their device. When they make the transfer, the expectations from the classroom also come along with that transfer. So the delivery method may change, but the classroom expectations for attendance, for grades, and for behavior remain the same. So regardless of the hybrid, the five, or the on-site, we want our parents, our teachers, our students, our administrators to continue the communication and provide an intervention as needed to ensure success for our students. At this time, I'll pass it over to Mr. Giuliano. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Next up, we have our high school Wednesday schedule. So, for the past few weeks, our 
principals have been working with the Office of Instruction to have conversations about the Wednesday high school schedule. We received feedback from teachers and from parents. Our principals have sought that feedback as well to make sure that we have information to make that schedule. So our high school principals were instrumental in taking that feedback and being able to work with us to create a revised schedule. That schedule was actually shared with our families last week and will be implemented beginning this Wednesday. It'll be based upon an A, B schedule, so every other Wednesday we'll have an A and we'll have a B, and they'll alternate. And also there'll be dedicated time for teacher collaboration each of those Wednesdays, professional development, and enrichment time, which is available for teachers to be able to work with students that need extra assistance. So our teachers will communicate with the students so they know how to access that time. Also, you'll notice this slide from the last time that we met. We are in the process of requesting our receiving forms for elementary right now. That window closes Friday, October 16th for elementary schools. And then our secondary window will open from on Monday, November 9th, and will close on Friday, November 20th. And you see the implementation of those scheduling changes per request. Not all requests will be able to be granted will be based upon space and schedule class availabilities, but the changes will take place on the first day for elementary the first day of the second quarter, and for secondary on the first day of the second semester. And again, those are based upon space and schedule availabilities as we, we take those requests. Then we start the process of working with our schools to see if it fits within schedules and the staffing that takes place. At some point, we do need to make sure that our scheduling and our staffing settles so we can we continue to stop the process and continue to change our schedules because it does disrupt our teacher schedules, disrupt our families as we move teachers from in-person to five and vice versa. So we do need to make sure that we get to a point into a process where our scheduling can be solidified. And that's how I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Milton. Thank you, Mr. Giuliano. I'd like to echo Mr. Giuliano's remarks. Um, we hear loud and clear from our faculty the need to settle and for assignments to be made and finalized so that our teachers can focus on teaching rather than wondering what assignment they may have that um, is caused by some request of change. So, Mr. Giuliano, thank you for bringing that forward. This slide is one you've seen before. We've updated it with some, um, some graphics to draw your attention to details. This, of course, is a summary slide of the important phases of outlines and anticipated dates that we have designed with our reentry process. I'd like to thank Ms. Brown for her update. You heard her say that we, we owe you all an update uh, because we continue to listen to make sure the information that we are presenting is based upon feedback and advisories and also inclusive of our principals and our teacher leaders. So although this presentation was prepared for the board and sent out last Thursday, I hope that what you're hearing from Ms. Brown and, and us is this work continues. And although you've had the presentation, of course, the community has seen the slide, we are committed to make sure that we continue to respond and, and monitor this information with responsibility. Um, if someone would advance the slide, well, thank you so much. So, uh, Mr. Cates, that concludes the report as designed. I'll be prepared for any questions. Ms. Hutchinson. Um, Dr. Melton, could you give us a little update about um, how phase two has gone with, with all of our schools? Uh, yes, ma'am, but quite frankly, and no disrespect intended, it probably depends on who you ask. Um, our nutrition staff, our transportation staff, our facility staff, they continue to accept huge responsibilities with how we're preparing. Our support staff is um, constantly watchful and attending to very small details that have huge impact. Our teachers um, overall was a, welcomed our students back. Our families last week seemed to be very positive and um, our students seemingly adjusted very well based upon information and things that I was able to see for myself. Our students were so prepared PK through second grade at the procedures of how to walk in line, how to prepare to receive your meal, those kinds of details that 
our teachers were doing more of the implementation rather than the rehearsal and the preparing of our students. Of course, those that have young children understand repetition is important, and our students were just tremendous. Um, they have accepted this, and seeing young children wear masks is still something that is unusual to me, but watching how students have been so responsive and um, ex responding to the expectations that our teachers have, ex have introduced in such a developmentally appropriate way. Our physical spaces continue to be prepared. Mr. Richardson was updating me earlier this morning that more plastic desk shields have been delivered. So if you talk with our staff, they continue to tell you they don't necessarily see a difference in the workload. But we are seeing more implementation with practicing and repetition rather than new expectations and new definitions of things. Ms. Hanley. Thank you. Um, I have a question for the middle and high school, um, virtual A and B. And I'm, I'm going to say all this. I know you know it. I'm saying for clarification. I know when we go back, the the classes come back together. So you've had the, had the A and the B days. So that will make one class. But are we worried about, do you have like a handle on the class size, Dr. Melton? when those classes come back together. I mean, I know that's, that's something we're looking at in lesson two, because we want to keep class size at a certain amount, but I realize you've already set this in place, and so they're going to have to be in that class, because that's how you anticipated when we went back to regular classes. So if you'd give me a little bit about that. Yes, ma'am, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, there's been such collaboration between our Office of Instruction and our Office of Human Resources our Office of Accountability uh, under Planning Administration, Dr. Harris's oversight. Our principals, APIs, guidance counselors, directors, assistant principals have been tremendous. They continue to monitor class size. Throughout last week, more changes have been made because of the adjustments and the request of families. Now that, as you heard Mr. Giuliano describe, we're trying to stabilize classes and numbers. Now that that stabilization is starting to come into effect, we are able to be more confident that teachers are getting their assignment for the 2021 school year. Uh, so when it comes to class size, we of course are monitoring that. Superintendent Spearman has been consistent to say social distancing when appropriate. So there are some spaces, some schools in this state, some places that may not be able to have the physical social distancing as expected but the insertion of when appropriate allows us to make sure. I will also say that our principals are reassigning locations. So if you walk, if you are able to visit our schools, um, uh, I'll give an example where a reporter visited recently at River Springs Elementary. River Springs has their cafeteria set up for their lunch. They have an art room, they have a music room, they have a science lab. So additional spaces have been set up to allow that social distancing. And we have teachers that are oftentimes using carts to go into spaces of elementary schools. So it depends on the class, it depends on the number of students in that class, but we're still monitoring class size to make sure that we're in compliance of board policy. And principals are watchful of the physical space to see if they need to relocate a teacher for a section or not, depending on what the need is. And then of course, the inclusion of these plastic dividers, similar to what you all see here tonight, uh, in classrooms that Mr. Richardson and Mr. Cannon continue to have delivered to classrooms to use when appropriate. Thank you, because I know I know that's been a concern for teachers, and I, I appreciate you keeping an eye on that, Mr. G Mr. Cates. I have like another one, but if you'd rather to take a round, I'll come back. Was, Mr. Lomas, I'll come back to you. This question is just for clarification. I noticed that we were talking about the hybrid model, and Kelly was up here and said that the uh, that we changed from zero to missing. Okay, and, and the connotation of that to me means leniency, and I was just wondering when we do return on the 9th, I believe, or in, will the connotation, well, how will that change from what, from what the folks that are already in, in the virtual learning are already faced with? I, I was surprised to see that there was a different scale for that, and I was just wondering Will that, will that go away when we go back face to face? Uh, Ms. Wallace, I can't say it will go away. I will say that Ms. Brown and um, school representatives have made that recommendation because our power school, which is our database for reporting, allows our teachers to insert that missing assignment rather than zero. In the past, historically, that zero has been a placeholder. 
So if a teacher codes something missing, that's still an alert to the teacher that latency is not going to be allowed, but there are circumstances that may intervene. So if we have a student that may have internet access where they can't get online, if we have a student that may be ill but the absence hasn't been reported, it gives the benefit of the doubt to the student and also to the family and gives the teacher a way to mark it so the teacher doesn't have to track what, who do I keep up with, what assignment do I keep up with. So it gives the teachers an immediate thing that they can code to make sure it cues them into where the problem is. So when students come back, we may find out from feedback of our teachers, this is working well for them to continue using this missing idea rather than the zero as a placeholder. We know that when families log in and see that zero power schools, because some families check power schools more often than some students. Right. Um, some get that alert and they log in very quickly because they're that watchful with um, oversight of their children. So we don't want to send the wrong message to the family because if, if that parent were to see that zero and then say something to that child, then that could create um, unnecessary disruption for the student and the teacher. So we're hoping that the missing will cue the parent in that it wasn't a zero assignment, it wasn't a zero issued grade, it's the fact that something is missing that the teacher needs that the parent then can have a different conversation with their child about. So, so my question is that all that goes away when we get back face to face and then we don't have that, that missing category? I can't say it will go away. I can say that we will seek feedback because if our teachers give us feedback that this process worked for them, then we're going to listen to their voice to see how might, we, how might we continue this once students are back in our traditional model of instruction. Or we may hear from teachers, does zero work better? Families may say, we're just going to keep watching that. But this is a new effort of ours to give it a try to see how it may go for communication um, between teacher and student, teacher and parent, and parent and student. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Melton, I must confess I was one of those parents. A uh, new power school before they arrived home in the afternoon. Um, and I did appreciate when teachers would put a missing in there so I could uh, encourage my students to, to remove that missing and recover that grade. And we recognize they didn't recover it at a hundred percent if it was just because they uh, chose not to turn it in at the time. So the, the missing part, I've seen that work well and appreciate that as a parent just to recognize what's going on. I had a question about uh, Wednesday school adjustment. Uh, it seems like we've made changes at the elementary level for that Wednesday <coughs> expectation and now at the high school level for the Wednesday expectation. Where's, where are we with the intermediate? Has anything changed there or is that a work in progress? Uh, yes, sir. Mr. Giuliano, if you could come and offer that update regarding intermediate Wednesday adjustment and Mr. Giuliano, for the benefit of the board, if you would give just a brief overview of all levels regarding Wednesdays. Yes. Uh, so for the elementary, that stayed consistent for the beginning of the year. The same with intermediate, middle, and high school up until this week is when we're going to adjust for high school. So at the elementary level, you have a, a traditional day to start the day with ELA instruction and math instruction, also some related areas, and a time for a break as well before lunchtime begins. And then in the afternoon, our teachers have collaboration, and they also have team planning as well, and professional development. So that's similar at the intermediate level as well. They'll have their classes in the morning, but then in the afternoon, they, teachers have that time for collaboration, for planning, and for pre professional development. Same at the middle level and now at the high school level as well. With the middle school, they do not have an A-B schedule. So our middle schools have the six classes followed by their lunchtime and then also their planning and professional development. Our intermediate schools do have that AB schedule that they'll follow. Um, so they'll have that at, at Crossroads especially so they can follow that AB schedule. But their schedule for Wednesday is not changing at this time. We are looking at intermediate and they're making, we're having some conversations with those two principals and they're seeking some input for um, when we look at that phase uh, three that's coming up in the near future that's when a change may occur based upon feedback. Thank you. Are there other questions before I come back to Ms. Ham? And Ms. Ham? Ms. Ham, will you turn your microphone on for me, please? Sorry, I just used my teacher voice. Don't you hear me? Um, 
the virtual plan was anybody that went completely virtual was it the, is it still the semester that they will be virtual and then after that is there is this still ongoing or is it possible that those virtual people that want to be completely virtual would go on longer than the semester that was your original plan Yes, ma'am. I'm going to ask Dr. Harris to come to the microphone and speak to um, some of this. Um, it is our commitment this year, Ms. Hammond, for the 2021 academic year to offer our virtual model of five for those that are in it and interested to stay in it. Uh, Dr. Harris and, and team, of course, have been working on the um, assignments and reassignments when necessary to do some balancing of things per request to families. So, Dr. Harris, if you would update the board on that question. Certainly, absolutely. We are certainly uh, looking forward to uh, reiterating some of what Mr. Julian said in terms of stabilizing our students in terms of the classes. But we do recognize that somewhere along the way, as it has in, in, in every year, there may be uh, a, a number of circumstances and instances that may warrant uh, another look at a student's schedule, uh, a student's placement in particular. So we do want to keep that open. Uh, we do it under the guise of hardship, so we do want to keep that available. However, we do believe that with the schedule that we currently have at the elementary level, as well as the two-week interval that we have at the secondary level, where well, there is yet another opportunity to move and make those transitions, be it the nine weeks or the semester, we do believe that that's going to carry and address the bulk of, if not the better part of, uh, those uh, uh, students who would want a change in that they've had a few days, a couple weeks to experience the current model that they're in. But I'll say and reiterate that, that they, in terms of a hardship, that is an initiative that we do feel like we do need to keep available just in case there are some cases that warrant an additional look or an additional review. Uh, we'll certainly make those available. And can I follow up to that with the teachers that have been doing the total virtual, if they, that's what they would like to continue doing or if they, I know the it'll be driven by students, I understand that, but if there's uh, a certain number of the teachers that would like to go back to the face-to-face, and they'd like to go back to their um, home school. Are we going to be able to honor that, or really we have to wait and see where the needs are for students? Uh, if I could ask Dr. Turner, our Chief of Human Resources, to come to the mic. Um, and if someone who has a clicker could go back to the instructional model change request slide, that would be a good visual for us to show. Um, this window, of course, is open and underway. Uh, Ms. Hammond, of course, as you alluded to, staffing follows student enrollment and where students are assigning to go. So this, this timeline of events, of windows that are open, definitely affect what we're trying to do. Um, but we understand that our teachers are very concerned about those that may have been the courageous trailblazers to go into five that want to go back to their home school as soon as they, as soon as they quickly can or as soon as they possibly could. Dr. Turner, if you could talk a little bit about the process and the communication efforts with our staff who have taken on some of those reassignments and some who have taken on additional assignments, if you could give an overview of that. We continue to be very respectful and mindful of teachers' requests. Although our staffing needs do follow the instructional needs of students, we're trying to keep the conversations open so that we are aware of staff that have expressed that they would like to return. And we try to keep them um, informed as to where we are in reviewing the instructional needs of students. Um, earlier, Mr. Giuliano and Dr. Melton spoke about the need to stabilize staffing. We've heard our teachers say that they need a sense of calm. They need consistency with their schedules as well. So right now, our goal is to keep that communication open. Um, but we would ideally like to place teachers back in the environment that they desire based on instructional requests of students. And Mr. Julian, I'd like to get you to come to the microphone next. Um, we're trying to make sure, Ms. Hammond, that teachers are maintaining a connection with their home school. So they may be teaching in five. So Mr. Julian, if you could describe for the board, what are we doing for those teachers who are teaching in five, but to make sure they're staying connected with their home school? So our teachers that are in five, they still are connected to the home school through professional development through faculty meetings, they're, they're in those schedules as far as when principals send out newsletters, emails, they're still in the same group, so they receive the group emails from the school, and then they also see, receive group emails from five, from one of our five administrators as well. But any kind of activity that's taking place in the building, any kind of professional development, 
any kind of communication. All of those are connections made to our teachers that are in five so they can stay as connected to their home school as possible. Of course, as a five teacher, they're going to start to create some bonds and relationships with other five teachers as well. We want to try to make sure they stay as connected to their home school too. So when they can, they'll do some data teams together if it's possible based upon schedules. And they'll also have some collaborative planning with teachers in, the, in their building as well because that was some of the requests that five teachers had made. Of course, whenever it's possible. We have found that some five teachers actually have started to enjoy really planning with their five teachers. So it, it's a, it depends and it varies based upon their comfort level and also their schedules. And Mr. Julian, if I could add, we, it's, it's difficult to imagine we're already in the process of looking ahead to the 21-22 school year. But of course, we already are planning ahead to that next year. So if five continues to be a model that we offer, then we're going to need staff that are there. But if we find out that staff would prefer to return back to their home school, we're going to make sure that we adjust. And of course, later in the agenda for discussion this evening, any changes that we make with um, the assignments of students, that too will affect the placement of staff. So I, I'm, you hear me not committing necessarily to yes with a definite answer. You're going to be able to go back to your home school where you originally were to start this academic year. But those are some of the layers of things that we're managing as administrators to make sure that students are in a um, classroom ratio size that's appropriate and in compliance and the most successful for academic performance. And I appreciate your point about communication and informed. I think I hear that most from teachers. Uh, they're willing to do whatever it is you need them to do. Yes, but it's so important to be part of the conversation and it sounds like you're doing that. So I would, I, I commend that and I would like to see us do that. And my last question is for Dr. Melton on this. Do you have an anticipated time frame where we would get back to five days? Um, with confidence, no ma'am, not yet. Okay. I think we all know that's best for kids, but we also know you have other concerns you have to look at the whole picture. But I appreciate you giving us your plan. Yes ma'am. Communication is the key and I appreciate that. Thank you. There are other questions for Dr. Mill? Dr. Milton? That concludes the superintendent's report, Mr. Cates. Thank you, Dr. Milton, for those uh, two updates.